FNAF has a lot of fan made theories and some of those can be very hit or miss, but due to there being new theories made literally almost every day, there is bound to be some absolutely horrendous ones that will make your eyes and ears bleed. So I'm going to be debunking some of the most terrible, worst, bad, and whatever word fits theories ever made about FNAF. So as we take a look at these, please note that this video isn't meant to be taken seriously, because a majority of these theories are so bad that even if you wanted to take them seriously, you would be laughed at for doing so. Anyways, before we get straight into these terrible theories, I'd just like to say that I am a little bit sick at the moment and you can probably tell by my voice, so I hope that isn't too big of an issue. But one more thing, make sure to destroy the subscribe button if you love FNAF. Anyways, let's get into these theories. Now just like many of my other videos, we will be taking a look through these theories from the least worst to the most worst, with the first theory and arguably most reasonable one being that the toy animatronics were made specifically with the idea in mind that you can't stuff bodies into them. Now this isn't a bad theory at all actually. And and it actually makes sense if you think about it for a bit. But just like the rest of the theories we will be looking at, there is a reason it's in this video. The theory is very simple and self-explanatory. Back when FNAF 2 released, and around the time of its release, way back before people knew it was a prequel to FNAF 1, people suggested that the game took place in recent time, or at least sometime after the first game. With the main reason being how dismantled and destroyed the withered animatronics are, and also because of the new semi-modern toy animatronics. Many people started to speculate what the lore for the game was gonna be, and the most popular theory was this. Freddy Fazbear shut down, with the main reason being for its closure being the missing children's incident. So several years later, after that incident, they decided to reopen a new store, with new animatronics and so on. But due to the missing children's incident in the last location, they decided to make new animatronics specifically so bodies can't be stuffed into them. Now as I said, it sounds pretty reasonable, except for a couple of things. Why would the new pizzeria keep the old suits that had dead bodies? in them all those years ago. They would have 100% been taken in for evidence by the police and wouldn't have been given back. Also, why would they keep those suits in the back? Like, if the toy animatronics aren't able to be stuffed, then what's stopping someone from going into the back and throwing the bodies in the withered suits instead? I don't know, it just doesn't really make sense. Like, it sounds good in theory, but in reality, it's just a little silly and doesn't add up that much. But a majority of early FNAF theories were like that, so it's nice to see that a majority of them have evolved and have turned into better theories as time progressed. And trust me, this one, a actually pretty decent compared to most. But the next theory we're going to take a look at also falls into the same category as the last, with it being also a fairly old theory, and with it also being about FNAF 2. And that is the Mangle is a Dog theory. Yet again, very self-explanatory, but also at the same time, why did people think this? Like, clearly Mangle is a fox, just like how foxy is, but, well, that's not what the theory is about. This theory suggests that Mangle is possessed by a dog. Now, why would anyone think that? Well, to be honest, I have absolutely zero clue, but I'd say the main reason is thanks to MatPat's theory about it. The main piece of evidence that people point to that supposedly confirms this theory is the static noises and lack of speech from Mangle, which is an okay argument. But then when FNAF Ultimate Custom Night released, it completely debunked it because of, well, this. It's so much more fun to get out in here with you. But then there is still a theory that Mangle is possessed by both a child and a dog because of the two heads, which is also very valid but still has no evidence to back it up. It's very clearly shown to us in the Save the minigame that the dead children are the animatronics and that there was no dog involved at all. I mean, there is a decent amount of evidence proving that this theory is wrong, with the main thing just being that Mangle talks in Ultimate Custom Night. I mean, go up to a dog and try to talk to it. I can assure you it will not talk back and will most likely just bark at you, which we do not see Mangle do. Now, just for the sake of this video, length and my own sanity, I won't go any further into this theory because it's a whole rabbit hole in of itself and it's just a little controversial at times because people like to believe it even though it's, well, probably not true. So to take a step away from FNAF 2 theories and go into a more broader one that isn't that well known about, at least I don't think it is, we move on to the next theory, with that being that Scott Cawthon had the whole story thought out from the beginning. Yet again, like the previous two theories, this one is also very self-explanatory but just completely idiotic. Now I don't think I need to explain why this is completely idiotic. But since the whole point of this video is to debunk these theories, then I guess I'm just gonna have to. Let me just say blatantly that the answer is obviously no. Of course Scott Cawthon didn't plan out the story from the beginning. With how confusing and convoluted everything is, if he had taken the time to plan everything, I think we would have understood a lot more about FNAF lore. Because I can assure you that it wouldn't be this confusing. We also need to remember that when Scott was developing FNAF 1, it was going to be one of his last games ever. With the main reason being that all of his other games 
just failed massively and he was gonna give up game development. And it just happened that FNAF 1 actually got really popular and did super well, which is the main and only reason Scott decided to make sequels and continue game development. Now even though this theory is very stupid and easily debunkable, the next theory we will be taking a look at is even more stupid and is probably the most inappropriate out of any FNAF theory ever made. And that's the adult theory. Now there is a lot to talk about when it comes to this theory, but to try and not get this video demonetized and to try and not traumatize any potential young viewers that stumbled upon this video, I will try to explain this in the most simple and least inappropriate way possible. The adult theory is a theory that became popular when FNAF Sister Locations trailer first came out, and the developer of Pop Goes, Kane Carter, was the one who first began this theory and had it spread online. The theory was a prediction that FNAF Sister Location would have more provocative themes to it, with the main reason for Kane Carter thinking that just being the designs of the animatronics, because he just assumed that they looked like they were aimed for adults more than children, which doesn't sound so bad when you think about it, but then that's when the theory went completely downhill, and that's because more people started to add on to it, which caused it to have the reputation that it's known for today. The theory then divulged into people assuming that this game was going to have more sexual undertones due to the animatronics designs, with the evidence being, well, mainly just that, along with some hints that could suggest that from the trailer and Scott's website. I mean, there really wasn't that much to suggest that the game was going to be like any more provocative or NSFW than just the animatronic designs, and even then, they're not really that bad, so just the whole idea behind this is just kind of ridiculous, and I don't know how it got like so popular or just developed into what it is now known for today, but it's just, I think it's really stupid. There is a lot more that goes into this theory, but since I do need to pay the bills, I won't go any further because I do not want to get demonetized. And just in case that this video does get demonetized, make sure to join my membership or send a donation so I do not go homeless. If any of you guys do, I'll shout you out in my next video. Anyways, let's move on to the next theory finally, with this one arguably being the worst, and that's the Freddy Fazbear's was made by Nazis theory. Yeah, this one is wild, but let me give some backstory real quick. This theory was made and popularized by FNAF YouTuber XX Pro Class Gamer XX. A month after FNAF 1 released, he made a video discussing his theory on the backstory to FNAF, and well, I'm not even gonna try and explain it, so I'll just show a quick snippet of his video because he explains it way better, and I mean, obviously, he was the one who made the theory. But yeah, anyways, here it is. Before the establishment of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, it is believed the building used to serve as a laboratory that performed inhuman acts. This torture house, as it should be called, was a result of a collaboration between two scientists in 1949. John Smith, an American scientist, and Abel Hines, a renegade Nazi scientist, are the ones who formed this collaboration. After World War II, John met Abel Hines, a Nazi scientist who escaped from Germany and immigrated to the U.S. These two met in the ACS, also known as the American Chemical Society National Meeting of 1947, where Abel Hines revealed his vast knowledge of eugenics. Many of the chemists quickly dismissed his ideas of eugenics, but John Hines was thoroughly intrigued. John Hines was an expert in inorganic chemistry and biochemistry. He owned a building located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in a suburban area which was three blocks away from the downtown area. The two showed interest in science and experimentation alike. In 1949, Abel officially co-owned the building. The building would serve as a secret place for experimentation and torture. The goal of John and Abel was simple, achieve immortality. Little did they know that such a simple phrase would lead to unimaginable suffering for them and future generations. Genes can be extracted easier in a child than an adult, so they decided to lure children and focus their experiments on their feeble bodies. Their thought process throughout this ordeal was that the sacrifice of weak, hopeless children would serve a greater cause for science. This was the only idea that kept them sane. Their method of kidnapping was impeccable. Abel, possessing hidden secrets of Nazi technology, was able to construct sophisticated exoskeletons that can move on their own and could easily be disguised. Yeah, I don't know man, seems far-fetched, but if you remove the Nazi elements, it is kinda actually pretty accurate to the FNAF story we have today. In certain ways, obviously, it's not 100% accurate, but you know, there is some kind of, meh, it's a little, little kinda close. Anyways, I think that's enough terrible theories for me to deal with for today, so if you wanna watch something that is actually entertaining and not pure trash and, well, talks about Nazis or anything like that, you can watch one of these videos that are on screen right now.